Anne Bailey. I'm not going to dive into it too much because we're going to ask Suzanne a little bit about it and have her tell you about it. But it's a really neat story and it's really neat to catch her portrayal. And um, hopefully as we look towards next year, you'll be able to catch her at an event and see some of her wonderful portrayal of Mad Anne Bailey. With hunting season in full swing or just about in full swing, be sure to check out the sponsor of today's episode, Thor Bullets. Thor bullets are a premium full bore muzzleloading bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor bullets do not require those pesky plastic sabos or belts to be fired. This means less cleaning for you between shots. Their patented copper base creates an airtight seal that gives you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's all copper unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy to follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Here pretty soon, Thor is going to be expanding into a new 40 45 caliber bullet designed for a faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles, so be sure to keep an eye out for those. For more information on these great bullets, visit ThorBullets.com. I'm Suzanne Thompson, and I portray Mad Ann Bailey, and I'm the founder of OWL, Outdoor Wilderness Ladies. I remember your portrayal of Mad Ann Bailey as a young boy in Southern Indiana at, uh, at the Lore of the Lawfrey. It's been many years since I've seen that portrayal. I mean, has that changed much for you over the years? Or you... Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. That's really, um, gosh, I have such good memories of the lore. Oh my goodness. Such <laughs> good times down there. So sad that it, uh, that, that event didn't uh, get to continue on because, wow, we had so much fun. Well, that's great and when to hear. You, yeah. And when you say, did, uh, did my portrayal or did my uh, story change over time? The answer is a hundred percent. Yes. And no. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure how other people do it. My, um, my portrayal or my story as Mad Anne is first person. I tell it a hundred percent as if it is me, and I'm telling you about my life. And so the key points always stay the same. When I was born, when mm -hmm. I was married, when uh, my husband was killed and the battles and, and those specific aspects are always going to be the same because they're facts, they're true. However, the story as I tell it does change dependent upon the audience that I'm with. So for example, I talk to um, a lot of of DAR groups. Well, the Daughters of the American Revolution ladies are really more interested in Anne and mm -hmm. her story and what was it like for her in that time period. But when I talk to the um, when I talk to the SAR, the Sons of the American <laughs> Revolution, oh my goodness, that's a different story. They're more interested, um, many of them, in the battles and the the historic details, and they are more inclined to hear about what was it like in that battle or when she was facing the Shawnee. That's so it's different depending upon the audience. Yeah. And I I I feel the story so much in me that it it feels very real every time I tell it even though some of the details are a little bit different each time, the facts always remain the same. Mm -hmm. I think that's neat. I think a lot of things, I mean, even just a little you know, bit meta about the podcast is it's, it's changed. I mean, the format is very similar and a lot of times I'm using, you know, the same little audio blurbs from previous episodes, but just it, within a year's time now, as we approach one year of doing this, it's changed a lot, but it's still the same in a way. And mm -hmm. I, th I think that's mm -hmm. across the board, no matter who you talk to, whether it's somebody like you doing a historic portrayal or somebody building or, or making accouterments, everything, mm -hmm. you're making the same thing, but it, it's changing a little bit and growing with you. And I think that's a really fascinating kind of subset of, of living history and traditional craft and things. Well, you're exactly right, because if it were by rote or the same every single time, whether it was 
you know, if it's a, a Ken Scott hunting bag, mm -hmm. everybody loves a Ken Scott hunting bag or a Shelly Geyer hunting bag. If that's, if they only made the same one over and over and over, that becomes manufacture yeah. and, and it loses the, the context of the, of the artist. And, and I think that's exactly the same thing, whether you're talking about the, the podcast or I'm telling my story, if it was exactly the same every time, well, I wouldn't need to keep telling it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ken wouldn't have to keep making, you know, I mean, maybe he'd have an army of people making the same bag over and over a manufacturer yeah. of it, um, a factory, but that's not what people love. They love to say, wow, I have this, this book that was, you know, a Ken Scott, or I have this bag that Shelly Geyer made for me mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever that particular piece of um clothing you know i can say oh well my petticoat was made by mike mike dollinger or you know whatever it means something yes. because there's a personal connection there and i think that's that's something i love about what we all do in this muzzleloading living history traditional craft space is whether you're you're interested in competitive shooting or traditional trek or historical trekking it's still much more personable that or personal i mean than other subsets of the hobby i mean you can go to a modern shooting match and the the gear and the equipment's not nearly as personal as somebody's muzzle loader that they're using because it's it's so much more hands on i feel than anything else i mean my the little trekking kit that i'm putting together for myself is so much more special to me than my off the shelf hiking boots that i went out and yeah. you know and picked out with 30 other people at the store exactly exactly and and it's so much fun too when you get to an event and um somebody says Oh, you know, that's a, that's a really nice looking rifle you've got there. Um, I'm able to, to hand it over with just this incredible amount of pride and say, mm -hmm. you know, this was built by the master gunsmith, Homer Dangler. And, you know, for some people, they, they take my rifle in their hands and they, they lay it across their, their palm. And they they feel the balance yeah. and, you know, they they put it to their cheek and they're they're just like, that is a will of the wisp. You know, they, yeah. they feel it and and they connect not only to me as the person who owns that that piece of art that's a rifle, they connect to Homer. And because Homer made this particular rifle as a replica they are really connecting back to that Pennsylvania rifle style yeah. and maybe even the the person who originally held that the original yeah. that's that's what i just i think is so like you said kind of meta <laughs> yeah <laughs> i find myself thinking about this stuff a lot and just what you said there really kind of gives me goosebumps it, it sounds cheesy but it really does because that's what is so exciting about all of this and seeing all of it change but also i mean like we talked about earlier stay the same i mean that's something i mm -hmm. in the first episode of the show we talked with goex or a representative from goex about it and that all of this we can look at the hobby and things and the listeners of the show and you if you you've listened have have heard this before but mm -hmm. it's it's not dying out it's just evolving and it's yeah it's super interesting to, i always i always come back to that but i love getting into that conversation with somebody else where you're subset of what you do with it is different than what I'm doing it. And it, we all kind of meta mush our brains together and, and get excited about it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It is. It's a really strange, um, small, small world and yet so large at mm -hmm. the same time. Um, for example, when, um, when I, when Ken and I got married at Martin station, we met some people uh, from Switzerland and Marcus and Yvonne, uh, you know, uh, were the first, I think it was their first time at Martin's and we had connected on Facebook, but, um, but we hadn't met in person, but we met them, they met us and they uh, much like us had just gotten married a few, maybe a few months before us and also in a historic wedding ceremony. And, 
gosh, I think six months later, they stayed at our house for a week, you know, and we never <laughs> found in our lives. That's you awesome. know? And yet they trusted that they could come from Europe and travel across the States, staying with people that they had um, met online and at these events at, at Martin Station. And um, they, they've traveled extensively to Niagara and, and others. Um, but it's, it is that tight, close knit community in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So how did you get started in living history? Yeah. So, um, I got started about 20 years ago or pretty close to that. Um, and I started going to rendezvous. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Definitely started in rendezvous. And the folks that I met at Morgan County long rifles and Wolf Creek muzzleloaders, Thunder Creek, they were just so incredibly welcoming and helpful. They, I just made great friends there and we'd have some amazing shoots and woods walks and, and hawk and knife and all the, mm -hmm. you know, archery competitions during the day. And then at night it was songs and stories all night long. And I just, I loved it. I just, I fell in love with it. And I, I got to a point where I had been hunting for a, a long time and um, with modern rifle or, you know, not rifle, but modern shotgun. Yeah. And once I got involved in rendezvous and I was out shooting every month, you know, we're out there every month. All of a sudden it hit me. I was like, well, wait a minute. This is really just deer hunting practice, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I transitioned from hunting with my um what Remington 1100, I think, to what I was shooting then, which was a Thompson um, Renegade. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it and I just I fell in love with all of that. And, and was fortunate to to be able to harvest deer in that way. And, and it just, I don't know, it felt like a deeper challenge after all the years of, of hunting with a shotgun that it, it just felt more real real connected yeah. i don't know just different oh yeah um so so the hunting aspect of it and the um the friendships and the fun and all of that i just i really really fell in love with it all um and then i got divorced and a few of my girlfriends were like oh thank god now you're done with all that weird old timey stuff and you don't have to do that anymore oh no and i was like yeah right right <laughs> and i was like uh no uh i'm just gonna do more of this now i have more time yeah. for it i don't have to so, drag somebody around i'm gonna go out and have fun right right <laughs> No, it was actually, we were pretty, um, that was one thing that we were very, uh, compatible. We both liked rendezvous a Wonderful. lot. Um, That's good. So yeah, yeah, that was great. But, um, but yeah, I traded, I had bought a GPR rifle at, uh, the Connor indoor show mm -hmm. and it was one of those guns that I like, you know, I shouldered it and I, and I held it and I thought, well, this is going to be my transition from a cap lock to a, um, Flint lock. So I bought it and I, it, it was so heavy. I got to tell you, Ethan, I could, I could nail a target the mm -hmm. first shot, second shot, maybe, but by the, by about the fifth or sixth shot, you can just follow the line straight towards the six. So I'm right. like, if it was a clock, you know, cause it was just too nose heavy for me. Yeah. Um, and when I got divorced, I was like, well, I want, I want my, my renegade. I want my GPR. I want my personal reenacting stuff and my daughter. That's what I want, <laughs> you know? And, um, and after, um, you know, after a few months, I realized, oh, crud, I don't have anything. I don't have a tent. I don't have, you know, all my stuff. So it was a really great opportunity for me to pare down. You know, I had gone from having the big giant wall tent, you know, it was huge. And I had a, a, a bed and a chandelier and, oh, a, wow. you know, all the fancy stuff that all had to get in a um, in a trailer, you know, mm -hmm. like a car hauler trailer. Well, oh, wow. when I got divorced, I didn't have all that. So I traded that um, GPR and I traded it for a tent um, and it was hilarious. So 
I'm, oh gosh, this is so long ago. I was on Frontier Folk, right? Do you remember mm-hmm. Frontier? Well, I don't know if you no, remember. No, no, I don't, I don't personally remember. Like, <laughs> I, I've heard the name. people do, yeah. right? Well, I got on Frontier Folk and I said, hey, I have a GPR I'd like to trade for a tent. And some guy, you know, just some random guy says, hey, I'll trade you uh, a wall tent, uh, or not a wall, but an A-frame for uh, for that GPR. And I'm like, okay, great. So he sends me a message and says, why don't you just meet us at our rendezvous and uh, be sure and bring at least 50 rounds, bring your hawk, your knife, your archery, everything. So I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. And I say to my mom, hey, mom, I'm going to go to this rendezvous by myself, and I'm going to trade a rifle for a tent when I get there. And she's like, oh, no, honey, I've, I've read about things like this. I've seen this on Lifetime TV. <laughs> they're, they're like, they're going to hunt you or something. You're going to be on the next 48 hours. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. And I was just dying laughing. And I was like, mom, uh, seriously, I don't think that anybody is going to like try and kill me by telling me to bring a gun yeah. and 50 rounds of ammo and you know all and you're hawking your knife and <laughs> right 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 but um so i got there and everything was fantastic it was a great rendezvous a wonderful shoot um the tent was just what i wanted just what i needed and um and then i was just off on my own um, I, I, I was able to just go by myself whenever I heard about an, um, a rendezvous and I went to like all the, the shoots at friendship, the, the spring and the fall and that stuff and, and other club rendezvous. And then, you know, it's, you may know what I mean, where the more you do, the more you do, mm-hmm. right? So you go to one place. So let's say I went to exactly a perfect example. I went to Laura the Lawfrey and I met some people I didn't know. And they're like, hey, you should go to Locust Grove or you should go to the Feast of the Hunter's Moon or Mississippi 1812 or Pokemon Foster. And I wasn't a member of any particular group or a unit or anything. But I made a bunch of friends and yeah. and they let me go <laughs> with them. They're yeah. like, yeah, just join up with us. And most of the time I dressed as a, a soldier, a long hunter or something like that, because I wanted to be on the field. I, I didn't want to be on the sidelines or, you know, back at camp or portraying like a camp follower or a Molly or something like that. Uh-huh. So you know, I just dressed as dressed as a, a soldier, and wow. um, you know the yeah, and the guys at um, Laura the Lawfrey, I was I was in with the Highland unit uh-huh. um, at Kokomon Foster. I was uh, in with the uh, the Germans. <laughs> it was just you know, every week I was something different, right? Um, but the first time. I found an event that I personally wanted to go to and it had a jury application and I didn't know what to like, how do I fill out a jury application for myself? I wasn't in a unit. I wasn't a soldier. I wasn't in a group. I just didn't know what to do. And it really made me stop and think. And, and I, I just kept looking at this piece of paper and thinking, Hmm, how am I going to, get to this event by myself, not as part of a group. And, and they're going to let me, they're going to accept me (laughs) jury application. Right. Yeah. And I thought about um, some of the storytellers that I had seen at the different events that I had just loved, you know, the, the, the real stars in my mind uh, uh, were like Carol Jarbeau when she would portray, Oh, shit you just want to cry when you think about it. Right. When she was Maggie Delaney or Mel Hankla as uh, Simon Kenton or Stephen Cottle as, as Daniel Boone, you probably, you know, you said you were a little kid at Laura the Lawfrey. You had to see Daniel Boone at Laura the Lawfrey. Definitely. And you felt like you saw, you felt like you met Daniel Boone. Yeah. And that's what it finally occurred to me was, I wanted to do that. I wanted to be somebody. And I just, I wasn't into some of the other roles that I, w- I saw women portraying and the traditional things like, mm-hmm. you know, whether they were 
a washerwoman or other, you know, camp follower things. And so I, I, I was really stumped on how I was going to go forward, but I knew I wanted to be a storyteller. So it was kind of around this time frame. I, um, I got invited to a couple of treks. Um, Jim Jacobs, um, he uh, invited me. We met, I think, at Lore and um, a couple of rendezvous. And he just out of the blue, he invited me to go on a trek. And, um, and then a couple of other treks came up that I got to go to. And then, um, so I'd just been this long hunter type person mm-hmm. <laughs> for lack of a better word. It's a, it's a really fun kind of base go-to for anybody that likes being yeah. outside and is interested in living history. For sure. For sure. So when Prickett's Ford out in West Virginia put on the school of the long hunter, I was like, well, yeah, yeah. I'll go to that. And I got to meet uh, Mark Baker, who I really admire. He is just a phenomena. Um, you know, I'd read all of his articles and muzzleloader magazine and mm-hmm. Pilgrim's journey and, and all of those books. And, and I, and I saw he was doing all those treks. Um, and, and I was just thrilled to go to the school of the long hunter. And that's when I met Maddie and Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I got out there and and because it was in West Virginia and that's where she is from. Um, of course, it was Virginia at that time. And they told me some people told me about her and they said she was a huntress and I hunt and she was an Indian fighter. And I'm kind of a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> and she's crazy. Well, God. I was hooked. I'm like, well, yeah, that's, that's perfect. That's awesome. Um, and that's for me, that was the rabbit hole opened and right in, I went both feet. So I started literally that weekend at Prickett Sport. I bought some books. I started reading everything. And then, you know, once I got home, anything I could get my hands or my eyes on. And I was like, she just spoke to me. It, mm-hmm. it was a hundred percent she is me. I am her. <laughs> this is the way it's going to be. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Now, I don't know. I've, of course, I feel like everybody should know who Maddie and Bailey is, but not everybody does. Yeah. Um, so she is, in fact, a real person, like I said. And it's funny because I have a really hard time talking about her in third person point of view. <laughs> right. You spent a <laughs> lot of time like, researching and being her. I can, yeah, I, 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 that's something I was kind of curious about, but I didn't really know how to ask that question. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird thing. I would be as comfortable saying, well, Suzanne was born on the east side of Indianapolis mm-hmm. and she did this and that. It's it's that hard for me in some ways to talk about Mad Ann as in that third person. Um, but but so that you do and your audience has an idea of, of factually who she is yeah. um, or who she was. Um, she was born in Liverpool, England in 1742 or thereabouts. And she came to this country. She met and she fell in love with a soldier named Richard Trotter. And he was the love of her life. They had a, they had a son and um, she uh, was devastated to become a widow when he was killed at the Battle of Point Pleasant in, um, well, it was October 10th of 1774. And so she became a widow and she was absolutely distraught beside herself. She could not take care of their son. She didn't even think she could take care of herself. Wow. So she took care, she took her son, William, to a neighbor like 13 miles away and and offered him into their care. Um, that family had lost a son uh, in an Indian raid. And, and I think that Anne just felt that connection to Mrs. Moses that, that she, she could trust her to take care of her son. So yeah. she leaves her son. She goes um, to what's then called Fort Lee and um, she offers to fight. She's ready to go fight, but they say no. You know, of course, <laughs> no, of course they say no. She's yeah. a woman. There's no way you can't be a woman and fight. So what instead is she becomes a spy and a scout. She's a huntress and she carries letters 
from all the different uh, wilderness forts and carries goods from one fort to another. And really, she is a um, recruiter. She's getting men to join up into the fight. But what she's most well known for, the, her big event that the um, poem is written about and what she's most well known for is in 1791, Fort Lee was under attack by the Shawnee and they discover that the powder magazine is empty. Oof. And that, yeah. <laughs> and you and I and, and our listeners, your listeners, we all know that without powder, you can't fight. You, yeah, you're you, done. <laughs> your gun is a club at that point. And so she looks around and she's waiting for somebody to offer to go to travel to Fort Savannah, which is a supply fort, and nobody offers. And she's she just gets madder and madder, and she's like, I'll go. And she just says, I trusted in the Lord Almighty. I knew I could only be killed once, and I had to die sometime. Wow. So she jumps on a horse, a black horse that later they give her, and she names it Liverpool. Um, she jumps on the horse. She rides um, across the um, across the wilderness to Fort Lee. The men there fill, you know, a mother horn and and um, other uh, powder. They give her and she rides back a hundred miles to Fort Lee. They fight against the Shawnee. They fight them back and they win. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so she, the Fort Lee actually becomes known as Charlestown. Okay. Charlestown later becomes Charleston, which is of course, as you know, the, the capital of West Virginia. Mm -hmm. So she is literally a founding mother. If it were not for her, we wouldn't even have this capital of West Virginia. Um, but that wasn't enough for her. Yeah, <laughs> In she her had to keep going. 70s, yeah, she kept going. Um, she had married a second time. That's where the name Bailey, John Bailey, um, and she were married. He also uh, passed away. Um, he was murdered and she was on her own again. And Oof. she was living in a cave when, um, and this is so hard for me to tell, like not as her yeah. because it's such a, a monumental moment in her life. She's living in this cave and she's telling stories in exchange for rum or in ch exchange for venison or whatever bread, whatever somebody will bring her, she'll tell a story. And one day a man comes and she's just, she doesn't want to tell this. So she's done. She's tired. She's in her seventies. She has told the stories, mm -hmm. but she looks up and he has black hair and he has blue eyes. And, the, and just instantly she's in her seventies and she just thinks, Oh my gosh, I'm, I've died. And Richard, my husband, Richard has come for me. Hmm. But no, it's not Richard. It's William. It's her son. Uh, and he has found her. He's heard these stories of this mad woman, this crazy woman living in a cave. And he he forgives her for leaving him as, as an orphan. And he asks her to come uh, to live with him and his family. And she she just thinks about all that she's lost, everything that she has lost in her life. And now she she gets it all back. Yeah. She gets it all back tenfold when she has her grandchildren. And so she at 77 years old, she leaves the Kanawha Valley. She moves. Um, she she move like a moving van doesn't right. come. <laughs> Rolls up at the cave. She, a couple guys hop out right, of the truck. And... Right. Yeah, she she uh, leaves with her son and she goes to um, now I got to tell you, I have a really hard time with this name. It's either Gallipolis or Gallipolis. Okay. And I will I will not make a claim as to which it is, but she goes to the Ohio Valley <laughs> where, <laughs> her, where her son William lives 
and together they build a log cabin uh, for her so she doesn't have to live in, in his home. Um, and she lives there until uh, 1825, and then she passes away in her sleep at that time. Hmm. So she is really literally a local legend and a character, a heroine, you know, yeah. and, but she's mostly a storyteller. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I really, I really believe that she had the same outlook as I do. When I write for Muzzleloader magazine or Muzzle Blast, I gotta let you know a little secret. I don't always let the truth get in the way of a good story. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, I think that's characteristic of Mad Anne that she, she was living by her wits and she was telling the stories to engage people to get them to to know what it was like to lose her husband to fight the any Indians and to lose everything. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really what I try and do. Wow. Um, yeah. So, and as I said, I do a first person portrayal, um, like, like Steve, uh, Cottle or Mel Hanklow or Carol, we all do, um, a real, well, Stephen and Mel and I do a real, single person. Mm -hmm. What makes Carol different and what I love about what she does is she does a composite character. So Maggie Delaney or um, Caroline Lennington, they're not one single person. They're a composite of much of the research that she's done. And the cool thing about that is, and there's, there's pros and cons of both, but Nobody's ever going to go tell Carol at the end of her story. Uh, let me tell you, Maggie yeah. didn't do that. You know? um, actually, because Maggie, yeah. <laughs> Whereas for me, like if I if I mispronounce in Virginia or West Virginia the town of Gallipolis, and I call it Gallipolis, somebody's going to come up to me afterwards and say, "No, she moved to yeah. Gallipolis or Gallipolis, whatever it is." Because she's a real person. Right. And I I treasure that. I love it when people come up to me after or, you know, they send me an email or a, a message on Facebook and they, they say, oh, that was my great, great, great grandmother or, you know, was related to me somehow. I love that. And I see it as a great opportunity for me to learn especially if they have a primary source. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If there's something you know? that somebody knows that that's kind of been held close, that isn't, you know, in a book or, or online anywhere. I mean, that, that could be really valuable to somebody like you. Exactly. Exactly. It's just, it's exciting. Those opportunities. Um, um, so if a person is listening to this and they're thinking, wow, you know, I, I really love, those storytellers like, you know, whether it's, um, you know, Al, um, Albert Roberts uh, used to do great um, portrayals as the doctor or the surgeon. And if somebody is out there thinking, I'd like to do that, but I don't, I don't really know. Well, my suggestion is your first thing is, are you going to do a strictly first person portrayal or are you going to do a third person? Are you going to tell about that time period yeah. or are you going to tell it as if you were that person um and if you're really going to be that person you have to be that person and you don't drop character you know that's yeah, I mean, who that, you are it, much like uh like ann bailey you had to you had to keep the allude you had to keep the story going that's how that's what exactly. you that was your livelihood and it, it's exactly it's the same now Huh. Um, I, I can remember one time I was at uh, in Fort Wayne at an event and um, I, I ran into a guy that I know really well that is a native reenactor and he started to walk into the fort like you do, mm -hmm. you know, because he just was going to walk in and I was I screamed and I, you know, I was like, you know, telling him to stop and to get out and the men calling for the men to, to protect the port walls. And, oh, wow. you know, and this guy was like, looking at me like I was crazy. And I had to kind of give him a, a, a wink yeah. or something to say, you know, go along with this yeah. because this is Anne, um, not Suzanne. This is Anne. Right. <laughs> and then, and then from that point on, he and I, wherever we were, we would always have these exchanges that were, you know, very 
loud and and boisterous and and big and sometimes he got to kill me sometimes i got <laughs> to kill him <laughs> you know it was a lot of fun yeah I mean, um, that, but that, it's, that keeps yeah. it uh it keeps it exciting for you, but then also, you know, if there's any visiting public there too, that adds yeah. such an element of realism that they're never going to forget. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. And I got to tell you, it took me a long time to develop my portrayal of Mad Ann. But once I did, it is so deep for me. It is, it is, it feels like me. I mean, I gotta tell you this, uh, and this is just such a weird thing because I'm not a person that really believes in all this kind of stuff. But I gotta tell you, the first time I went back to West Virginia after I had started portraying Mad Ann, mm -hmm. I'm driving along. I'm by myself. I'm headed out. I think to to Prickett's Fort again, and I'm driving and I'm going over the Canal River, and I am not kidding you. I am so serious. I could hear in my heart. I could hear her saying, I'm home. I'm home. Oh, wow. And I could feel it. Like I, right now I have goosebumps. I had such goosebumps then. I'm surprised I didn't have to pull over. I probably should have. <laughs> um, but, but that's how deeply I feel it. And people have asked me, are you going to do another character? Have you considered that? And yeah, I've thought about it and, and I do some, just some fun stuff. Like at Mississauga 1812, I've, I've done Mad Zan okay. where I, I'm a river pirate, but, but that's not a real portrayal. That's right. just something fun. Um, I, I, I have a suspicion of a future, um, a future person who is also a, a real person. Um, and she actually, her name is Anne Royal and she interviewed Ann Bailey, probably the last interview uh, that was published um, about Anne in uh, 1824. And Anne Royal published that she was a journalist. And I think if I ever got out of 18th century and jumped over to 19th century, I could maybe be Anne Royal. That'd be maybe. neat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, there's that connection there. Yeah. And so maybe, but it's, it's hard to, you know, it's kind of hard to even imagine that. Right. But yeah. That's, that's just the, the commitment that I have with Anne. <laughs> well, I think that's great. I know I'm, I'm excited for hopefully next year to be able to go out to some events and maybe catch you or catch Anne, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Out, out yeah. of the fort or, you know, out in the field having fun. Absolutely. Well, we'll all keep our fingers crossed and our masks on and yeah. hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, that's all we can do at this point. We're mm -hmm. buckled in. So Exactly. Could you tell us a little bit about the OWL? Because that's what I've seen you doing a lot this year. Um, so, OWL. Um, it's Outdoor Wilderness Ladies. And I it sort of came from my experience in reenacting and not so much rendezvous maybe, but more reenacting specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really hard for specifically for single women or women who don't get into reenacting and rendezvousing through their husbands. It's, there's a lot of um, stereotyping and maybe some animosity and that type of thing. And I really wanted to be taken seriously. I wanted to be treated like an equal. And it was, and it was really hard to accomplish that. I feel like I have, I, honestly, I, 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 for the most part, I really feel like I have been accepted as a qualified player oh yeah <laughs> I, guess. I, I don't know any, anybody who I, doesn't I see what you do and, and have mad respect for it i just get out of get out of the way <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's it's taken a long time and um it, but i do feel that acceptance Good. but it, it didn't come easily and um you early on years ago um i had been doing some treks like i said with jim jacobs and and with some others and I was uh, sort of 
uh, secondhand invited to go on a trek with uh, a pretty famous guy. Um, and it was a guy that really inspired me and a lot of others to get out and go trekking. And, and I, I really, uh, I was so excited about it. And I trained and I, you know, I was out walking my neighborhood. I was out walking the, the woods with all my gear and everything because I did not want to be the person that held everything back or anything like that. Right. And then uh, unfortunately, um, that kind of famous fella uninvited me oh. <laughs> and he said in, in no uncertain terms that it was very specifically because I'm a woman and he Jeez. just, his integrity wouldn't allow for a woman to go on this trek in Kentucky and I was devastated. I mean, I was so like, I, I was hurt. My feelings were hurt, but it also made me mad. I was, I was just, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I, I just, I couldn't believe it. And when I developed or I really coalesced owl or the outdoor wilderness ladies it's a reflection of that. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got enough and gumption in me that um, I thought, you know what? If I've been told no, there are other women who have been told no. And if they weren't directly flat out told no, like I was, it's been implied that they weren't welcome or yeah. they weren't invited. And so it's just, Actually, it's really cool that something that hurt my feelings actually ended up inspiring an opportunity for women, for many, many women to get out and go trekking. And that's that's why it's so important to me, because I really, really want to not just inspire other women, I want to empower them. I want them to leave one of my treks, whether it's a light night, which is, is just a one night sort of, but almost like a try it before you buy it, yeah. <laughs> you know, where, um, and I'm so lucky I've had, we've had so many nice, um, donations generously given to us that I'm pretty well able to outfit a woman other than shoes really from the, the ground up with That's everything awesome. she needs to get out there. But it gives her an opportunity to build a fire, build a shelter, to know she can pack all of her stuff and carry it and and be confident in that. Yeah. And I don't know if you've in some of my well, not in some in all of my articles that I write about trekking or anything uh, that I publish about about owl. I have three rules and I'm going to tell it to you straight. You, I, I think this is PG enough. Um, my three rules are carry your own crap, be ready, willing and able to carry someone else's crap and don't bitch. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Those are my three rules. And they're kind of funny and, and you can laugh at it, but they really are pretty serious. We train hard for our hard treks. And when I say carry your own crap, that's what I mean. I was going to say, if you can't carry it, don't bring it on a long trek. I mean, that's oh. something that I think a lot of people uh, overpack for, for like a, you know, a camp. You you bring all the, the stuff that makes you comfy. But uh, right. when I think about going on a trek, it's I've got to carry it and it better be useful because it's going to be heavy tomorrow. Yes, yes, exactly. And that's actually why on my um, website, on the OWL, um, it's actually the OutdoorWildernessLadies.com. I have a resource page where I have a trekker checklist okay. and it is everything that a person could need. And the hardest part is exactly what you said. It's what do you not need? <laughs> you don't want to carry everything you want. You only carry what you need. But I put together with the help of a number of other ladies and other resources that I put together this list on my website so that the girls, the ladies can put a check mark and they have to give me this checklist before they go on one of my, um, on one of my scouts. 
So they can either check they have it, they don't need it, or they want to borrow it, or they want to lend it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that way we really are building community. I get all the checklists back and I see, oh, well, um, you know, Caitlin doesn't have a blanket, but Beth has an extra blanket or I was um, donated to oil cloths. So I can have um, maybe Laura, who has a wonderful big shelter that's great for some things, but it's I have a lighter weight one that was donated. She can use that instead. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it, I put all this together for them. Um, but it goes back to, so you you have to be able to carry your stuff. But what's really, really important is that second rule, which is be ready, willing, and able to carry someone else's stuff. And that, the, the importance of that, I, I don't think I can stress it enough. It comes from two things. You have to be able to carry someone else's. If they get hurt or they need help or whatever else, whatever other reason, the implied message there is if you need help, ask for it. Yeah. Everyone there is has committed themselves to being willing and able to help you. That, that's, I think, the most profound rule I have. And then, of course, don't gripe. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> that your attitude is probably the most important thing you can take with you on a trek. Yeah. Because... If it's raining on you, it's raining on me. Yeah. <laughs> it's not raining any more on you than it is on me. But if you're complaining and moaning and groaning about it, you're making it worse for everyone. Yeah. Everyone has to endure it. But given the choice between laughing our heads off in a snowstorm on, you know, a Kentucky mountainside. Oh, or whining and crying about it is it's a no-brainer to me yeah. <laughs> the best stories are not oh it was 70 degrees and the light wind was blowing yeah. my hair in the breeze you know our feet were it's, dry and it was perfect right right <laughs> it's no it, it snowed and then i set fire to my stockings and yeah. you know <laughs> the, Jeez. The, i cracked my rifle stock you know that's the story um, and that's, that's what I really want to give other women are those stories, not the miserable ones, but I want them to be able to go out from this event and, or this scout or trek and say, I can do this. Yeah. And not only can I do it, I can do it with other women. And so it's not about oh, all these women just have to do it with me. I don't even, I, I have no desire for that. My desire is for them to do it themselves and to start sister groups or subsidiary groups or their own entirely. They don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be owl. It could be whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what's been so inspiring to me is to see other groups of ladies that attended maybe a light night with me or a, a hard scout. And they go on and get their group of ladies to do it in their area. Because, you know, my treks are generally Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, you know, maybe Ohio. But. I had a lady, the one of the first scouts I went on, You, the, Christine is amazing. She jumped on a plane, brought all her stuff. I picked her up at the airport to go wow. on a trek. Yeah, we had never even met in person. And she flew out from Utah and, and joined the trek, you know? That's awesome. And I guess if there's one other thing, I asked the ladies um, recently, at a, at a trek, and I try and ask this always: Why did they do it? Why did what? Why did they want to be here? Why did they want to join this group? Or why did they want to go on a trek? Yeah. And oh, it's it's so deep. Some of the reasons it's it's mental, it's physical, it's emotional the the stories that that have been told around the 
campfires, you know, three, five, six, nine miles away Mm -hmm. in the middle of the night are stories that touch your soul and make us true sisters may not be forever. We may have, you know, we may separate on Sunday and not see each other for a year or maybe never again. But boy, that connection is just profound. And the trust that is built between women that are trusting each other with their capabilities and their deficiencies and their their sharing not only their skills, but their lack of skills. And that's heavy stuff, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. And it's, you know, I I have learned things about people that I, I did not know and would never have imagined. And the the weight that they carry is profound. And yet there they are right beside me or right beside someone else. And that's, that's really, that's why I do it is to give women the opportunity to experience it, to, to develop skills, whether it's, like I said, starting a fire or building a shelter or, you know, for myself, I decided I had to, um, I couldn't rely on the fact that several of the women that um, go with me are either RNs or physician assistant or, you know, all these um, medically trained people. So I decided it was important for me to go get my um, wilderness first aid certification. Oh, sweet. It's it's about growing and learning and challenging yourself all the time. For a limited time, the listeners of the Muzzle Blast podcast can head over to thorbullets.com slash NMLRA. We'll have a link in the show notes. And you can enter your name for a chance to win a pack of premium Thor Bullets. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. So it's a little, I, I don't think I had on the questions here, but what is your, what does your trekking kit look like? What are you carrying and how much does it weigh if you know? And (laughs) Oh, I know. (laughs) Trust me, I know. (laughs) I know exactly what it weighs. Um, So my rifle is seven pounds and I do not carry my shot pouch or my shot bag or my powder horn. Um, I actually asked a lady, I try and use, um, women artisans as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so I asked, uh, a lady, Sarah Boyd to make me a pocket, um, uh, horn for my powder. Okay. So I keep my, my powder, my toolkit and my ball bag in my pocket uh, of my frock coat. Yeah. Uh, so I don't have all those extra straps because, <laughs> oh gosh, I don't, I have come away and my neck looks like I was choked by somebody with big burly hands. Yeah. So I got rid of those two straps of the, of the shot pouch and the, and the powder horn. I put those things in my pockets and then Shelly Geyer made me a fantastic pack and we took some liberties. I'm not going to lie. We, I, she went with me on a trek. She, I showed her the, tr- the pack that I had made and I told her what I wished it had. And she took a hide from a deer that I had um, killed a couple of years ago and uh, was brain tanned for me. She took that and she built me this fabulous awesome trekker pack it's a gorgeous um, I, I fell in love with that pack as soon as she started posting it it's it's just perfect I know. I know right it's awesome i just it's spectacular um and it has just the right amount of pockets and and areas to store things so even little things like i always try and take my journal with me where i keep um some wilderness safety notes mm-hmm. in my journal Um, and then my kettle, uh, I keep a small, um, uh, nesting type kettle with a, uh, a cup that, uh, that does not have a handle. 
I had Lisa Joe Cruz. Lisa Joe made me uh, about a half a dozen little Ann cups. I, I'll I'll share a picture with you because oh, cool. uh, she she made them for me to keep in my in my trekker kit. And I had her make me a half a dozen of them because I knew I'd break them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know they'll break, but um, that'll make me buy new ones from her. So right. that's her <laughs> business, and I, you know, whatever. Um, so I keep my kettle and my coffee cup and my coffee all in the kettle in the pack all together that with my, um, food and my fire kit and a first aid kit, the pack itself comes out to 13 pounds and then my bedroll, which is, um, my oil cloth and one baker bundle i usually use the smaller like twin size baker bundle uh and sometimes i add a wildy blanket that i have and i'm gonna tell you something i'm embarrassed but sometimes i have to take a thermo rest there it is there's my big <laughs> my big you know i'll i'm my face is red right now while i say it but there are times with my back that I, it's a choice of either go or don't go. Right. And if it means don't go, I made a cover to go over my orange thermo rest and nobody else can see it. And I carry it. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't always, um, sometimes, uh, in exchange for that, I just take a length of lambskin or, you know, a piece of, uh, you know, wool, of wool, mm-hmm. you know, lambskin i guess is the best way to describe it that is kind of a long and skinny it is about the length from my hip to my shoulder and i use that just depends on how i'm feeling but since the bedroll is another like 18 eh, well 13 to 13 to 15 maybe 18 pounds depending on what exactly i pack in there um so I've also got my an extra linen shift and an extra pair of stockings, a cap, and uh, usually a wool bed gown inside. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, about 15 to 18 pounds on that. And then water. Ugh, oh, water. Isn't that the worst? Yeah, I, I didn't even think about water. I was, I was sitting here adding up the weight and I was just like, man, this is going to start wearing on me. And then you say water oh, and I just yeah. think, oh, no. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, the thing is, it, many of the places that we track, there isn't water uh, available. So you have to carry it and you have to carry enough. Well, let me just share with you. You may know this, but in case somebody doesn't, a gallon of water is a little over eight pounds. Eight <laughs> It's heavy. Yeah. So first of all, you have to have a vessel to carry it in. So I use a um, a hollowed gourd, you know, because the gourd itself is very lightweight. Yeah. Um, I know other people use um, uh, tin or copper uh, canteens, um, but I like I like my gourd. So I carry a, a pound, uh, eight pounds of water. That's, and then sometimes even this last trek where we weren't sure if we were going to have enough water. So one person took a, a water filter and uh, so she carried extra weight of carrying the water filter in case we found a place to filter water. But I carried my gallon of water plus another half gallon. That's another four pounds. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so this is not for the faint of heart. It's hard work. And when I tell these girls, when I tell the ladies, you've got to do trek prep. And what trek prep means is you put on the shoes and the stockings that you're going to wear on the on the trek and you walk a similar geography, you know, topography, I should say. Yeah. You can't just go like walk on a treadmill in your tennis shoes. It's not the same if, you know, I think it's. If they're the worst thing in reenacting, it has to be shoes. They're the worst. Oh, yeah. (laughs) There's no such thing as a comfortable pair of shoes, right? Right. I mean, that's the thing that really, really gets me about historic clothing is the shoes. We have come so far with shoe technology of everything we have right now. I will take a nice pair of boots with Gore-Tex over just about anything else. 
No joke. No joke. That would be between shoes and or boots and water. Those are the two things I hate the most about <laughs> having to, you know, do all the right stuff with this, with this trekking. Right. Um, I, uh, I try, I bought a new pair of, uh, Fugawi, uh, trekkers and I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to work them in and I've worn them about, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 miles and they're still giving me these blisters just to kill. And so I, I'm still wearing this pair of Robert land, uh, boots that I have that I, I I just have to share a picture of them because they look sort of like the truck on, um, do you remember that, that cartoon called cars? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There there was the, the, uh, there was some pickup truck that, that just looked old and worn out and just pathetic. That's what these shoes look like, (laughs) these boots. They're ripped out and half my hobnails are gone. One of my heel plates is missing and yet, those are what I end up wearing yeah. that and a pair, you know, a couple pairs of, uh, stockings. And that's, so when you, when you prepare for your trek, you got to wear those shoes and socks. That's, that's critical. And then the other thing is whatever you're going to wear, like ladies, you may not believe this, but I think we're very lucky because we get to wear stays or jumps and, you know, you guys, you don't get that extra support, but we do. So imagine, I mean, the stays or jumps, all these people, and I was one of them once who said, oh, they wouldn't have worn those all the time. I would, if you gave me the choice between wearing modern undergarments and wearing historic undergarments for a trek, I'm going to take that, those jumps any day of the week, because now I have a firm, solid, support yeah. and it it's great um and it's great to take off at the, at the, yeah. at the end of the night <laughs> but it's but it is much more comfortable and easy to carry the weight but when you are training and you're carrying your pack and your bedroll then you should wear the um the garments that you would wear in the field so to speak yeah. so that you know how things are going to wear um, because they wear differently. They just do. Hmm. Fascinating. I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very lucky w- with this job just to be able to listen to people talk about neat stuff because I just, <laughs> I can listen to it all the time. Well, and clearly it's something that I am passionate about. It, I, I kind of go a mile a minute and I apologize because I barely, I think I barely leave you time to to contribute it's just oh. because i'm so excited about it all people aren't here to listen to me i can tell you that <laughs> <laughs> a, a note on that about the outdoor wilderness ladies i think it's just i think it's great just across the board that you're introducing people to an area of it that could be difficult for them to be you know introduced on their own i just mm-hmm. across the board i think a lot of what we take for granted is something we love doing and i think people look at it and and just see all the difficulties of it rather than how much fun you can have right when you get started or after you after you reach that first exposure and you're beyond that you're ready to go on your second whatever be it a shoot Mm -hmm. making something or a trek however you see it once you get past that first hurdle you're just opened up to an entire new world of just great stuff across the board. Mm -hmm. And it's about the, the people that you do it with, they can make it or break it. And I, I have been in both scenarios where I was so welcome and I just felt like I had found another family and people were so willing to loan and to gift and to, make me feel welcome, that that's what I wanted to give to other people, particularly to women. And I've been in situations where I was denied and, and told I didn't, I couldn't, and I wasn't welcome. And I, and that they didn't want me. And 
I don't want other women to face that. I want to give them the confidence that they can do this themselves and they can learn so that when someone else, if someone tells them no, they can just go do it themselves. Yeah. I think that's a, a very American thing to feel. You don't tell mm-hmm. me no. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It really does. It's It harkens back to the spirit of our founding fathers. And we mothers. will find a way. And mothers, yes. And we will find a way. Challenge us and, and we will find a way to succeed. So speaking of challenges, where do you see living history going in the future? I, I think with everything that that we do here at the NMLRA, there's a lot of concerns about youth involvement and changing culture uh, that have people worried about where this is going to be in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And I was just curious as to uh, what you thought about that. You're you're already going out and making your own vein mm-hmm. of this, getting more people interested. And I was just curious as to uh, what you see and, and where you see this going. Um, I think that truthfully, the future is what we make it. If people are concerned about it, then they need to do something about it. It doesn't yeah. do anybody good to hand wring and 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 worry. It, it's do something, engage with people, make it accessible, start a group like mine or or you know or yours. Make people feel welcome and engage with them one on one. There's there's just nothing to be gained by making this more of an old boys club because it already is that. <laughs> we don't need to reinforce that stereotype. There's so much that young people have to offer and, and so much women have to offer yeah. that, that groups or sites or clubs that don't embrace the future, they're not going to make it. And unfortunately, some of them are turning away or turning off a number of people who really are the future and they have so much to offer. And unfortunately, I think that that will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If, if you reject the youth and you reject people who, who can make it the future, if you're not, if you're not growing, you're dying. Yeah. Um, and I, I really see it that way. Um, and that's, like I said, that's why I encourage the ladies in OWL to, to start sister groups, start their own groups, um, support people. And I've been so fortunate that whenever I've asked for help, if, you know, right before our, um, one of our tracks, I said, oh my goodness, help. If anybody has any of the following things to donate, uh, they will be used, or gifted to someone else who will use them. And my only rule is if, if, if we as a group give something to someone to help them in this hobby, whether it be a very expensive blanket or an oil cloth or even, you know, rope, you don't think about how, you know, you gotta have rope. So whatever those things are, if we gift it to someone, that person has to follow the same rules I gave my my daughter when she got in when she was in reenacting. If somebody gave it to you, you have to give it to somebody else if That's you no great. longer need it or can no longer use it. Yeah. If you know, just re-gift it and keep it going. Um, and and that's that's been wonderful uh that we've had the opportunity to gift people things and you know like um mary brandenburg her husband daryl donated rope to our group everybody that went on um an event this summer um each person got a, a coil of rope that's awesome and it goes back to just like i said you i can pick up that bundle of rope and go oh that's daryl brandenburg rope <laughs> you yeah. know it's that craftsmanship that 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 one-on-one artisan and this is probably the only hobby in the world that a person could pick up a piece of rope and say oh i know who this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it sounds a uh, oddly specific but i mean you're you're right on the money there it's yeah, and that's I was neat. walking in a parking lot one day uh, after a trek, and I was walking along, and I looked down, and there was this this piece of homemade tape. You know what I mean? Tape. Yeah. 
And and I looked at that and I was like, oh, I think that belongs to Beth Sturdivant. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, oh, my goodness, that's my that's my garter. It fell off my my leg. And I can't believe you found it. <laughs> I was like, well, I didn't think anybody else out here in, you know, this wilderness lost a piece of handmade <laughs> tape. <laughs> But it's a crazy thing. But I really do. I think that the future of our hobby is in what we make it. And I I really encourage other people to support the artisans and crafts people. Um, I personally, I choose as much as possible, not exclusively, of course, but I try to support female artists and crafts people because it's important. And getting giving the um giving your resources and your time to that is what will keep this hobby or lifestyle or whatever you want to call it <laughs> moving into the future i think that's great I, I think that's a real optimistic and and um realistic outlook on things thank you thank you this is this has really been a lot of fun. It's so um, it's just exciting to talk a- about what we're doing and hopefully exciting to other people who are listening to do it themselves or to join if they want to join with my group with owl, they can go to the website which is outdoorwildernessladies.com. They'll find resources, everything from, like I said, that checklist uh, to a blog with um, some articles that I've written. There's even uh, for somebody who wants to plan and and do their own trek. I have a video on there that they can watch all the resources that I have. I put out there to everybody. So hopefully um, anybody listening can can take advantage of that. And then, of course, I'm on Facebook as Mad Ann Bailey as well. OK, that's great. We'll put links to those um, to your website and the Mad Ann Bailey Facebook page in the show notes and on the blog post that will come out with the with the episode for the podcast. So if you're listening and you want to check out those links, we've got them down there. Be real easy for you just to tap on and just take a deep dive down this rabbit hole and have <laughs> some fun with us. Great, great. Thank you so much. It is really an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you. You couldn't have done a better job. It was fantastic. Well, thank you. I love to be an uh, ambassador, I guess. Once again, I'd like to thank Suzanne for coming on the show. It was a wonderful way to spend an evening. Once again, I I go away excited and energized about what's happening and where the muzzleloading living history and traditional craft communities are going in the near future and in the the far future, I guess. There's a lot of there's a lot of optimism out there. There's a lot of neat things happening out there that we're excited to be on the front end, bring you and sharing with you as much as we can. As a recording, we're headed into the beautiful month of November. A lot of the leaves around me have fallen now, so we're starting to get a little bit of that uh, dreary winter look to the outdoors. But uh, hunting season's right around the corner, as well as what I like to refer to as just winter project season. So I've been spending a few evenings here and there planning and preparing for some new Craftsman's Corner videos. If you're interested in making your own gear or kit or supplies of any kind, be sure to check out the NMLRA YouTube channel. We're going to have some new tutorials coming out soon. We've picked up some exciting things and I found some neat primary sources that we're going to be developing some items from. Hopefully add a little pizzazz to what you're wearing out to out to out to camp. We'll have links to Suzanne's work and her Facebook page, the Outdoor Wilderness Ladies webpage in the show notes, as well as the video description and on the NMLRA blog. So if you're interested in what she's doing, which you should be, it's super cool. Be sure to check out NMLRA.org slash podcast. You'll be able to catch the blog post that goes along with this episode. We'll have some more pictures of Suzanne's kit that she's going to share with us, as well as some notes that I've taken from the episode to put into writing so that you can reference them later if you're interested in getting involved with the kind of stuff that Suzanne's doing. 
Everything that we do here at the NMLRA and Muzzle Blast is brought to you by the membership of the NMLRA. We couldn't do any of this neat stuff. We couldn't talk to any of the cool people. If you'd like to support what we're doing here at Muzzle Blast, visit nmlra.org slash join. Your NMLRA membership is going to give you access to our home range in Friendship, Indiana. You'll also receive Muzzle Blast Magazine. It's the only monthly muzzleloading living history and traditional craft magazine published. You're going to get 12 issues. That's one a month for an entire year if you pick the one-year membership. It's a great magazine. It's packed with 84 pages of really neat stuff. And I got to say, I know I'm a little biased, but the magazines that have been coming out this year have been some of the best I've seen in a long time. I think they're doing a wonderful job over there. Dave, Amber, and Lindsay are really putting everything they have into it. They know that it's been a rough year for everybody, and they're making sure that when that Muzzle Blast magazine gets to your door, that you're going to be able to sit down and enjoy it and feel a little bit normal and kind of a crazy year. If you'd like to get a little sneak peek into the magazine, go to nmlra.org and search for the Muzzle Blast archives. I've been going back through and republishing some of our older articles that have come out in the magazine to give you a taste of the kind of neat stuff that we're publishing every month. So be sure to check those out. We'll have a link down in the show notes for those as well. It's been a real bummer of a year without being able to have any shows or travel to any events. But if you're looking for items that you would have normally picked up during those shows, please visit nmlra.org. We have two pages set up that kind of aggregate where you can shop from. Um, nmlra.org slash shop small. We'll give you a full list of the NMLRA vendors that show up and demonstrate and sell their wares at our events. We've also got nmlra.org slash advertisers set up, and that's going to have a full list of everybody who advertises on the podcast, in Muzzle Blast, on the videos. And these are people that care about what we're doing and care about our efforts to preserve and to pass on American history and traditional craft. So please, if you can support any of these businesses, large and small, let them know you came from us. That lets them know that we're getting the word out about them and that you guys are supporting what they're doing as well. You can join the NMLRA today at nmlra.org slash join. Your one-year membership is going to give you 12 months and 12 issues of Muzzle Blast magazine. You can get that delivered to you as an ebook or as a physical magazine mailed to your door. If you can't afford to do that right now, times are tough. We definitely, definitely understand that. Um, but if you can, please share the show with a friend. Uh, we've got links down in the show notes. You can pass those along on social media or text them or email them to a friend. And uh, by rating us on iTunes and Spotify, you really help us get out in front of more people that are interested in muzzleloading, living history, and traditional craft. And that's something that we can't thank you enough for, is, is sharing the show and, and sharing what we're doing here at the NMLRA. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time. 